you know, I've tweeted this before and I've told my students, but I think $44 billion is cheap for what yes. Elon actually got because Elon didn't buy a social media company. Elon bought one of the largest corpuses of real language data to train AIs on that's dynamically updating every single day. And right. not only that, he's kicked everybody else out of it. And yes. so yes. The, other, the other competitive models aren't going to be able to train on Twitter data going forward. Hey, y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. I am here with Dr. Andrew Perkins, who is full professor and also head or chair, I don't know which one you guys call it, of the marketing department at Washington State University out on the West Coast. So anyway, I'm very happy to talk with Andrew today. He was a guest on our show before about some Bitcoin stuff and Xcoin. If you haven't seen that episode, definitely check it out up here. But I wanted to talk to him today about something that doesn't really have to do with Tesla or SpaceX, but actually does have something to do with Elon Musk because he always talks about the Texas Institute of Tech Technology and Science, which I'll let you figure out what the acronym for that is. And that's why he laughs about it. Anyway, so he does talk about that stuff, but mostly this is about being a university professor, a high school teacher, even a middle school teacher these days with large language models like chat GPT and the radical difference that your students and your you know, your teaching is going to have coming up like right now, as soon as the school year starts. So first of all, hi, Andrew, and go ahead and introduce yourself and your background and stuff, and then we'll get into it. Yeah, so I'm a professor of marketing and international business at Washington State University. Um, I am the chair of our department, uh, which a lot of people are kind of like, congratulations, <laughs> kind of thing. I agree. Um, <laughs> and and I think a lot of the 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 prompt, I guess, to, to use the right term for this discussion uh, was you know, kind of February, March of this year, when ChatGPT kind of had its coming out party, um, a lot of us faculty kind of saw what was happening um, and started to see some of the some of the videos that were being put out by Ethan Mollick, who's a professor at Wharton, uh, and a few others um, talking about what kind of an influence this would have on the university um, educational experience. And so we actually, our team, our, our school, our, our college, um, put together a task force very quickly to start thinking about what we were going to do and how we were going to handle this, this wave of chat GPT hitting, um, hitting our students, uh, starting in the middle of the spring semester of this year, uh, and then, of course, getting ready for the fall semester, which is about what we're starting. So I think that's probably a, a good background for what, what this is. And so what I've been doing over the summer is coming up with some guidance and some some thought about um, what our syllabus should say, how we should guide students, what what's our kind of um, perspective on this? Should we be uh, should we be limiting and keeping it out of the hands of our students, or should we embrace this wholeheartedly? And I think as we go through this discussion, you'll kind of get the perspective that we've come up with, where we're going to attempt to integrate it into into the learning experience and the classroom experience for students and figure out how to best use this tool. And it's gonna be a lot of trial and error and it's gonna be a lot of effort and it's gonna be a lot of work for faculty because it, you know, if you think about things like essays or written exams or things like that, that those complete, those kind of assignments completely change. Um, and so I, I'm assuming we'll probably talk about some examples, got lots of them, lots of information. And, and so hopefully this will help other faculty and other teachers kind of, you know, start to think about how to integrate this into their own, into their own classroom experience. Right. And at the very least, just to get some knowledge about what's out there right now, because I have a feeling, you know, faculty members are not necessarily at the forefront of technology and stuff. Um, and so this may be something that's new to you and you've heard large language model chat GPT uh, or something and just don't know what it is. I, I probably should introduce myself because this may have an audience of people who are not the normal viewers of this this channel. So anyway, I uh, to, I I obviously have this YouTube channel and I run a company, but more to the point for this discussion, I am an as associate professor in theater and film studies where I teach 3D animation, design and writing. And I'm also the uh, faculty fellow in the Institute for Advanced, sorry, Institute for Advanced, I wish at Princeton, the, the artificial intelligence, is, oh gosh, Institute for Artificial Intelligence. There we go. I'll, I'll remember the correct title for this thing. Sorry about that. Uh, anyway, it's 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 a whole, it's an institute that encompasses all of UGA, like all of the different disciplines we have. Oh my gosh, I think upwards of 60 faculty who are associated with it now. So anyway, it's very, very broad based. 
my whole area is how to use artificial intelligence with the more creative arts, digital arts, things like that. And to the point for large language models, I will be teaching a uh, an introductory uh, screenwriting class this fall. And so at, last year when I taught this class last fall, this was not an issue, right? <laughs> ChatGPT didn't really exist until November of last year. So this was something that is just, it's brand new. And it's like, how do we deal with this class? So I don't know, Andrew, if you want to start with an example, I can also do more like a creative example. You could do a maybe more quant example or something because ChatGPT is no longer just for creative kind of stuff. It will also do analysis. You can give it a spreadsheet and it will it'll write up code and basically show you whatever you want about that, that particular, uh, you know, code base or something. So I don't know yeah, if you have a good um, example for us. Yep. Yeah. I've, I've got lots. Let me um, actually just show you, show everyone kind of the perspective that we're taking um, for, yeah, sure. uh, for our, for how to use this essentially. Okay. And so this oh, is, nice. I yeah, may steal so, this, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and we've got it. We put together a document, and and this is something that I can that I can share out. There's uh, already dozens of these out there, and if you're in, if you're interested, I can I can also share a um, uh, a shared Google Doc that is floating around that has the syllabus plugin for dealing with AI and ChatGPT for specific classes across the spectrum of the university, which is really useful. Right. So what we did is we kind of said, um, we want this to be inclusive. We think that this is going to be a competitive advantage for our students to be able to use these tools when they get out in the marketplace. Remember, we're teaching business um, and we're already starting to see this um, explode in all facets of, of business right. education and, and in the marketplace itself. So CBAI, just for my benefit? Uh, Chat-based AI. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's okay. what we use. We're going to change it to something a, a little bit cleaner here, probably. But that that's the language we're using internally um, when we were building this. Okay. Um, and so the the first point is that the, the the tool is supplementary. Okay, it's not a primary source. And in general, the idea here is going to be something like you're going to be using this tool. You're going to be using this tool in the classroom. You're going to be using this tool to complete your assignments. But we, you we you need to tell us how you're using it, right? Okay. So. Supplementary tool, use it to generate ideas, use it to generate logos, use it to generate all these different sorts of things, re write reports, but tell us which prompts are, right? What are the things that you put into ChatGPT to get the useful information or the useful content out? You, it's your responsibility to verify everything. So I'm sure a lot of people have probably heard about hallucinations or, or whatever. Um, that's getting less and less of an issue, um, but it's your responsibility as a student to make sure that what it writes is correct and within the context of the assignment that you're doing. Um, the uh, one of the things that one of the assumptions that we're making uh, is that uh, for all intents and purposes, Chat GPT generated or AI generated content will be indistinguishable or undetectable. Uh, by any sort of tool or plugin or anything like that. And if it is detectable today, it won't be detectable tomorrow. So this is going right. to be completely undetectable, ubiquitous at all levels. And again, super useful for, for generating all sorts of different things. Um, maintain academic integrity, right? Use it as a starting point, acknowledge any assistance. And so that means that in a lot of cases, students will be generating instead of a a citation index or a citation uh, bibliography at the end, it may very well be an additional chat prompt, right? With, you know, right. citing by, where this content was generated with this prompt. And that's going to be really fun because um, uh, when we uh, realized that this was hitting in February, March, uh, uh, well, we're in 2023, um, I was in the middle of teaching our, our capstone marketing class. It's marketing management um, you know, a 400 level class with unit, with undergraduates, all in marketing. Uh, and I immediately threw the syllabus out because <laughs> while the content that's in the syllabus and the the intellectual, you know, the, the, the things that you need to know um, stay relatively the same, the way that we were going to explore those concepts immediately changed overnight. And so what I did is I took the assignments that we had and immediately went and changed them so that we would be leveraging chat GPT and other AIs to, to complete them. So, uh, and then, and what happens, and this is kind of a, just a, a, a general observation is that rather than the students using the chat GPT to get out of doing work, 
what they did is they used chat GPT and AIs to do the work that they were less interested in the boilerplate stuff. But then they spent that extra time deep diving, discussing, strategizing, thinking about these concepts and principles that we we're talking about in class. And so for at least from my limited amount of experience and observation in the classroom, I saw that the students embrace this as a way to uh, uh, better integrate themselves and better uh, uh, experience the class, the classroom, classroom experience. Um, and I'll show you some examples of how we did that, but but I I feel like this has been a net positive so far. Um, and then, okay, and so that's basically it. Uh, the syllabus also has some things about what ChatGPT is, what they, these AIs are, but generally this is the, the rule that we, or the, the set of parameters, I guess, we've put around this. Right. When we talk to our faculty, um, of course, academic freedom, you can kind of do what you want in the classroom, but I have a feeling we're going to see relatively quickly that if you are an instructor or a professor who doesn't embrace use of these tools, um, that's going to start showing up in your teaching ratings. It's going to start showing up in your evaluations. And if there are options for student to take, students to take, they're going to take the options where they know that it's a faculty member that's allowing you to use these tools and, and, and so on and so forth. So um, we're in a really interesting spot right now where these tools are just emerging. They are clearly useful but they're also at the very beginning of the usefulness that they will have 18, 24, 36 months down the road. And so that's really where the interest and where the, um, where the development of these ideas is going to, is going to happen for lack of a better way of explaining it. It's like figuring out how do, how do we use this today, but also get ready to use it when it is a thousand times or a million times more powerful 36 right. months from now, right? right? We're not talking about decades here. We're talking about months. So. Right. Yeah, and and the difference between again, I I became aware of ChatGPT last it was right around Thanksgiving, um, when it first came out, and and the the evolution of large language models from there, and just the number of different ones that are out there now, has grown so radically. In fact, there's I keep hyping this, and again, I'm not. <laughs> people think that I'm being paid by Perplexity.ai, but Perplexity.ai is a search engine that has all the hallmarks of completely disrupting Google. It, it's an AI-based search engine. It's totally different. So we're not just talking about like the basics of like writing an essay or something. We're talking about analyzing data. Eventually, like at this point, I don't believe that my 3D animation class that I'm teaching in the fall is going to be impacted yet by things like stable diffusion and stuff, but that is coming very, very clearly. It's coming soon. And and it actually has an impact on even what I talk, talk to my students about future career paths. Uh, yeah. It's like, what do I want to learn right now? It's like, is it important to learn this stuff anymore? That's a really good question. So all of this stuff is like, we don't have answers, right? I think what, what Andrew, what you were just saying, the next next year, two years, somewhere in that in that realm is going to start to give us answers for exactly what this thing is going to look like, but we don't know yet. Um, but it's also very exciting. It's at a much slower level, it's like the introduction of calculators. I'm old enough to remember before you were allowed to have calculators in school. And then the introduction of things like using laptops and stuff. Every, at both of those, I remember there was a large contingent of faculty who were like, no way, can't use this, not possible. Well, today clearly demonstrates otherwise. Everyone has a laptop in class. People utilize the laptops to do research and stuff while you're sitting in class. It's like, oh, go search for whatever this is. People obviously use calculators now, <laughs> you know, learning the multiplica multiplication tables up to 30 or whatever it was that I had to do is no longer necessary. So you see these technological changes happen and you see people, you see universities and, and acad academic institutions like high schools and stuff, they, they change to that, but they change slowly. The problem with this revolution is it's not going to be one of those, you have a decade to figure this out. This, this is like, you got to figure it out now. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to get swamped. Uh, and and I, I think a, a part of that also is not only is it moving very quickly, but there uh, is an army of 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 year old kids out there all around the world who have access to this and are already banging away at it trying to write Shakespeare. Right. right. And so it, while we as university professors or as teachers uh, at a high school or whatever it is, we might have a group of 
10 or 12 people who are interested in, in trying to figure this out and come up with some parameters around how to use it and integrate it, it's not that the students don't care about us. It's just that their excitement in this space already has them working with it, writing code, building products, doing all of the, or, you know, writing essays, creating pictures. My, my 11 year old daughter um, uses it to create first versions of the, of the cartoons that she wants to animate. And so, and, and they're all working away with the goal of learning how this thing works, where you can push at the edges, where you can kind of push at the seams and how it can create value for me as a young person today. Right. And so they're the ones that are going to figure out um, what information is valuable to learn today, what's not useful just by trial and error, just by using this thing. Um, I know there's a lot of uh, heartache right now about, you know, people who are uh, coders, software engineers, things like right. that. Right. You know, could they go away? Well, sure. But my guess is probably there's going to be, it's going to be a, an additional tool in the toolbox for a lot of these individuals. Um, one thing I will say is, and, and this is a part that surprised me when I started <clears> diving <throat> into this, was we we tend to look at this from the perspective of the student, right? How do we keep the student from cheating? How do we use the use this technology or this technology to help the student in the classroom? What should we be training them? But another big part of this is how this affects the faculty. And I, you know, I don't want to get into a big navel gazing you know thing here, but when I sit down with this tool, uh, and especially in the context of having to rebuild a class on the fly. I found that it's incredibly useful for creating um, not only assignments, but also the um, uh, materials, cases, studies, those sorts of things that get students to kind of think about things a little bit more deeply. Let me show you, um, and there's, and just a, a, as an aside, or not as an aside, but as, as a part of this, when you look at the student experience with, with ChatGPT, there's a whole... I, I mean, my belief is that the next level of this is when all of us have our own personalized AIs on our phones that learn who we are, learn about the way that we best learn and create content, create um, study guides, create feedback, all those sorts of things that are individualized to the student, right? One of the things that is the most difficult about education is that it, it's very much not a one size fit all. I mean, we're all, we all learn a little bit differently. We all have better ways to learn and you're a little older than I am, but I remember sitting in those massive lecture classes in my environmental economics class where it would just be talking for 50 minutes and then wherever it ended, it just stopped. Right. And I'm kind oh, of, Oh, I remember that. And they're like, like on slide 15, we'll pick and back up again. spatial things and, yeah. The, and yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. And you're yeah. supposed to keep this narrative going over Monday, Wednesday, Friday, whatever. Right. right. Um, so people are really good at that. You know, I've got lots of friends that can sit and lecture and absorb it and they go home and they read the textbook or, you know, and do the, do the prot stuff. And, right. you know, a lot of people aren't like that. And so um, what we'll, what I'm hoping that we'll see is that we will see um, personalized AI and training. And there are companies that are working on this, right. That are, that are building out these AIs that are specific to your own needs for the way that you learn and such. And then if that AI, if your personalized AI needs something else, it may go out to a specific or a uh, an AI that's been optimized for a particular topic or a thing, and it'll, you know, get the data from that or get an interaction with that and then bring that back to you. Right. So I do think that eventually there's, it's not just going to be one AI to rule them all. It'll be, you know, millions uh, right. with each of us having our own kind of flavor of it, you know, with our own cultural norms and our own kind of things like that built into it. Right. Um, right. With, anyway, with all of the dangers, with all the dangers that come with that too. Yeah, because sure. you could end up in a complete echo chamber at that point where the AI is just a yes man. And it's just like, you're right, boss. This is a great idea. You know? <laughs> so it's a, that's the danger of it. The positive of it is, wow, how productive will we be if we have these things taking care yeah. of the basics for us, right? That's just amazing. I, I was listening to a podcast a couple of weeks ago, um, and it's the it's the CEO of Stable Diffusion. Um, and I can't remember yeah. his name right now, but uh, most, and, and this, uh, this um, idea of... of uh, having our own individualized AI, you know, his perspective is, is that, well, yeah, if I'm somebody in Indonesia and it has my cultural norms and my beliefs built into it, um, 
is that better or worse than a westernized general AI that has the biases built in from our cultural perspective, right? I mean, and you've heard, and I'm sure everybody in this audience um, has heard or seen the articles about different AIs having different political biases and things like that. There was a really neat study that just came out that actually maps all of the different large language models onto, onto you know, like libertarian and, and egalitarian versus right and left. And they're all in slightly different spots based on the, the questions that they ask as prompts. Um, and so what, just like anything, it's likely that people will gravitate towards the to, towards the models that best reflect their own cultural norms and beliefs. Is that better? I don't know. Is that an echo chamber? I don't know, because if these AIs are interacting with each other, um, that may help kind of balance that out a little bit. I don't know. Right. And that's down the road a little bit, but it is yeah. something kind of to kind of think about. Yeah, uh, it, it was. I wish I knew where that graph was. I saw it on uh, Twitter this morning. Just the, the the that split of like chat GPT was on the fairly liberal um, and I think like Llama was actually fairly conservative on that list. But anyway, it, I got it right here. Hold on. Oh, good. Okay. Well, pop that one up. I just looked up. It's it's uh, Ahmad Mostock is the, I looked it up yeah. on perplexity.ai. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> Don't need Google anymore. We can find that out. Um, yes, there, there. That's that's really cool, isn't it? So it may yeah. be a little small for people, but if you look down on the, like chat, G, GPT is all the way down the right. It's just like ding, 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 ding. So you can see that it's like, there's a lot of ones in that lower left-hand corner. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, and, and it is interesting, you know, there is this fairly large group up here that are kind of not left to right, but relatively authoritarian. I've got to go read the paper. I haven't gotten a chance. I mean, it literally yeah. just came back. The other thing yeah. about academics uh, is this space is moving way too quick for peer review. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, Archive just, is the solution. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I don't know what, you know, you and I have talked offline about, you know, six year review price cycles and stuff like that. It's just that's not going to work anymore. But anyway, right. yeah, we've got this uh, this neat uh, this distribution of of different kind of orientations uh, and perspectives right. across these different models. And, and to bring this back to Elon Musk for just a second, since he started X.AI, uh, it'll be interesting because they haven't produced an, a large language model yet. I assume they're going to have one, but he's made it very clear that what he wants is maximum curiosity. So if they can do a test like this with that model when it comes out, I'll be really curious to see where it fits into that graph like right. whether it's dead center or whether it's like super far right you know so who knows what exactly it'll be but it'll be really fascinating to find out well and then the question is is if it doesn't fall right dead center how much poking at it do you do to make it get on on that center of that axis right i mean right. is if if it really is and and you know i've tweeted this before and i've told my students but i think 44 billion dollars is cheap for what yes. Elon actually got, because Elon didn't buy a social media company. Elon bought one of the largest corpuses of real language data to train AIs on that's dynamically updating every single day. And right. not only that, he's kicked everybody else out of it. And yes. so yes. The, other, the other competitive models aren't going to be able to train on Twitter data going forward. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, there's, but, you know, at least... From my Western perspective, the it seems to me, at least in the in the things that I follow, that the majority of the discussion going on on Twitter is in English with a relatively Western perspective, which yes. may get us right back to the same problem. Now, if Twitter continues to expand and moves around the world, I, I could totally see that it would that it would generate more um, more content. But um, uh, Tr all, almost every model that's been trained so far is trained on the internet and the internet is largely Western until very recently, you know, and right. so a lot of the content right. biases towards Western perspectives and, pol and politics. So it's, yeah. it's a, it's an issue. Yes, clearly it is it, but I also agree with you completely that there's probably companies like, uh, like, like Google specifically, I imagine, and maybe Microsoft is like, damn it, we should have done this. <laughs> they were probably realized they're like, oh no, this is a really good source of information. And it is, it's, it's consistently evolving. Um, and I don't, for people who are not native English speakers, if you like, let us know in the comments, because it's hard. I do see like foreign language tweets sometimes, but not like maybe what 5% of the time or something. Anyway, I would be very interested to know if you don't speak English as your native language, if you do see a reasonable corpus of information that's out there in the language that you speak on, on Twitter slash X. So, um, okay. The tool is, is to translate those tweets in real time with AI. 
Yes. Right? So I have just a setting in Twitter that says translates all. Tra I mean, you know, right. in the Tesla world, there's a bunch of European uh, and German speaking people right. who focus on Tesla. Uh, and a lot of times they're they're hybrid uh, tweeting. They're yes. tweeting some in English and some in German. Uh, and I speak reasonable German. I can read it reasonably well, right. but it slows <laughs> you down, right? Yeah. Uh, and so uh, it, that would be that would be really cool is if you could just translate, you know. Right. You can do it, but it's awkward right now. But yeah. it would be really, it'd be cool if it, I guess preferentially you could just say, just show it to me in English and then let me like put a bar across the top that says this was originally written in Arabic or German or whatever it was, just so that you know. Uh, because I would like to know that because sometimes the translations can be a little goofy, <laughs> so you know, but they're getting better and better. I feel like we've hit Douglas Adams Babelfish land. It's it's we're, yeah. we're getting very close. And that that's one big advantage of these things is that they're excellent at translating. And that's always been a problem culturally is that if you don't speak another person's language, there can be this barrier. And this feels like it has at least the opportunity, as long as it can translate decently well, of breaking down some of those barriers. Um, I want to show something just real quick here, if I can find the right one. Uh, no, 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 no. Here we go. Um, for okay, can you see that? Yep. So I just, I just figured I'd throw out an example here. So while you were talking, I, I typed in, you know, write me a high school level five paragraph theme on Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. I didn't tell it what the thesis should be or anything. Uh, but you can see, you know, the thesis is that the theme of of fate is integral to understanding. Then it's got three paragraphs that have that support it and a conclusion. And I could always tell you, you know, please give this essay a title. And should get something here in a second. <laughs> Fitting. I, okay. So there you go. So you can see at, if you are a high school teacher and that doesn't terrify the heck out of you right this second. <laughs> I mean, I just did that. I half-assed it. I didn't even give it any real information. So if the if the student just took your prompt and you have one of those one paragraph prompts with a rubric that said exactly how you were going to grade it, they could fill that thing in and they could get back an essay that would would fit what you're asking for with a high degree, you know, at least something like an A minus or a B plus or something, it would be able to do it with, out of the box without the student even having to like really interact with it. So this is the kind of thing where you have to be aware that this is there. It's a negative, but also it's a positive because how can you utilize this tool for in-class writing assignments? And, oh, here we go. Look at that. Yeah. Look at that rubric there. <laughs> so, so, oh, okay. you're actually so, doing this to create an assignment. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And and this this is, I think, for this is the advantage, I think, where this is where the student and the professor come together to yes. actually create a lot of value using these tools. And so in this case, this is an assignment uh, that my students were doing online. And they, um, this, there's this model in marketing called the BOR model, which stands for brand um, offering and relationship. So it's, just, it's the three sources of value that's created for a customer, right? Super simple. They've been talking about this stuff all semester. Really cool. So I ask um, ChatGPT4 to assume you're a marketing professor at a university teaching senior level undergraduates. The students are introduced to the BOR model. I kind of explain what it is. Um, and then... Uh, come up with a rubric out of 20 points for this assignment. So then it generates this rubric. And what the students were to do was to just was to take a sustainable competitive advantage for Tesla, of which there are dozens, pick one, explain how it creates value at the brand level, at the relationship level, and at the offering level. And the offering is the is the like what the actual product is and what it actually does. Uh, and then and then the second part is explain how a competitor might um uh, might counteract that or fight back against that sustainable competitive advantage. So it generates me a rubric. Uh, and then I said, uh, complete this assignment in such a way that would get you full 20 points. Okay. Right. So it generates, so I'm going backwards, right? So I'll build me the rubric. Now generate an, generate an answer. So I've got this. I can use this as an example in class. I can use this as a template. I can use it for any sorts of different, different thing. But then what I did is I asked, how likely do you think competitors can catch up to Tesla. Now I'm asking the chat GPT this, not, right, right. not the students yet. And what it does, and this is amazing to me, is it generates a list of five different sustainable competitive advantages, or I should say, you know, options for, for the competition. And then it gives me a high probability of catching up or a low likelihood, low likelihood or high likelihood of, of catching up. 
And so right. what this does is instead of just, and, and this is a, a chronic thing I find in, in students when they're answering these sorts of questions. If I say, as part of the assignment, ex, uh, explain how the competition could catch up on this SCA, you'll get an answer that says something like, well, if they put a bunch more money into R&D and maybe do some partnerships in, in industry, they'll be able to catch up. So a very superficial response. Here, what I'm doing is I'm getting them to think at the kind of next level up. It's like, okay, what are the components of this SCA and under what conditions is a competitor likely to catch up versus not? Right. And right. the nice part of it is, is you can then in class, what we do is we say, okay, let's look at these. So investment in research and development, high likelihood of catching up. If, com if competitors significantly invest in R&D, blah, blah, blah. Well, then the question is, well, how likely is it that the OEMs are going to be able to invest in more R&D. Well, then that gets you into the discussion of the balance sheets for the Fords and the GMs of the world that right. have billions of dollars of debt, billions of dollars of liabilities related to, to retirement funds and all those sorts of things. And so that would suggest that there's not going to be a lot of money to put into R&D in order to try to catch up Tesla, right? right. right. Um, uh, existing market position and brand, or let me do the collaboration par partnerships. Well, yeah ostensibly I could go out and find partners and, and companies to work with me to build, to kind of leapfrog my technology forward. But what's the likelihood of that? Well, if I'm a, you know, second tier uh, manufacturer, am I going to sign a long-term contract with uh, an OEM that looks like they're on the path down? Or am I going to sign a long-term contract building products for EV companies that look like they're on the way up? Right. So it makes it harder for the OEM or for the incumbent, I should say, to uh, to build these partnerships out. And so that way in the classroom, we can talk about that and really get people to think about, okay, what under what conditions are these statements going to be true? And how likely is it that those are going to happen? And I think that's really where where a lot of the experience and discussion with in person is going to help. And I mean, you can do it online as well. But uh, in the classroom, these are the, and then, you know, all of our you know, have rooms have whiteboards. And so there's teams and they put up their ideas and we discuss and things like that. So in this case, oh, and the nice thing is it took me 30 seconds to build this assignment, right? If I had to build this from scratch by myself, it would be hours. Right. And so all right. of a sudden the, the faculty have more time to work on, you know, figuring out how the best way to get these assignments to really hit in the classroom, teach the right. concepts that you want and engage the students in the discussion and the strategic thinking that I'm expecting at the senior kind of level. And this is a relatively right. simple assignment. Yeah. And and I, I would say that one of the one of the things that is my favorite about these language models is not even necessarily the final output, but the ideation le like level. It's like, wow, this thing is so I can say, like, give me I in fact I've asked it before from our YouTube channel. I've said, please give me 10 titles that are, you know, gonna pop for for this particular topic. And it will pop up with those. And yeah, none of them are perfect, but like one or two, I'm like, oh yeah, that's that's really close. And then I can tweak it. So in terms of like ideation, it's just like having a fantastic like partner <laughs> that's, that's yeah. just always there going like, yep, yeah, I'm willing to do it and I'll try it. So, um, so one what, of the things that the oh, students do- Oh, interesting. Yeah, okay. Yeah, is they, um, they do this simulation through the Harvard website, which is called the bike simulation. And it's a uh, kind of quarter by quarter competitive- uh, zero sum market share game of right, companies right. 3D 3D printing these bicycles. And so one of the things they first have to do is they've got to create their brand and they've got to create their their identities. Now, traditionally what you do is you'd have a bunch of students sitting around going, well, I want to do this. Well, I want to do that. And then there's probably some pencil and paper and maybe a little bit of ideation that way. And you come up with some sort of logo or else they go search Google for something that they sort of like. So here what we did, and this is back, you know, kind of when Dolly was the main one. Now it's everybody's using MidJourney. Um what they did is they generated their um, their brand attributes for their company. They probably come up with a brand name by that point, which they've also done using ChatGPT. And then they just feed that into MidJourney and have it generate a bunch of logos, right? And now this is five months old, six months old. It does much better today than it did then. But you'll notice that the pedal pushers, so this is one of my teams, this is their description of their company, the description of their product, build me a logo that represents it. And so you get to translate the verbal description that a, that a marketing team might come up with for a product or a brand directly into the logo without going through 
a third party designer or whatever it is. And then of course, with Midjourney, you can iterate, iterate, iterate. And what's neat is that in class, since everybody's got a laptop open to uh, Midjourney, instead of generating two ideas or three ideas, we're generating dozens and dozens of ideas. And then all of that gets aggregated into a document. I put it up on the screens and we start looking through everybody's. Okay, how did you do this? What did you get here? How did you think about this? And that's the part. That, and so that, again, we're getting into the discussion and the, and the reasons why we did things rather than just, ah, oh, I've got to generate something, you know, to, to turn in sort of thing. Right, right. And this, uh, this walks that line because marketing is that interesting line of very left brain with the analytics and very right brain with the creativity. And, and so you get to explore both of these because of course you could then, <laughs> if you want to test market these logos or something, you could then explore the analytics of, of what the responses are to the different ones. I, I personally like the BR cycle one. I don't know why that sort of neon one. I'm, <laughs> yeah, I, I really I'm a relatively like minimalist kind of guy. I like simple logos and things, but, um, but anyway, yeah, that's very cool. Well, and um, you're right. You know, one of the things we are going to do this fall is we are going to AB test all these or right. ABCDE test them. Let's use it right. to Facebook and spend a few dollars and, and things like that. So, right. and, and you can easily do that. It's, it's really, so I can, so I can hold my text constant and I can just change out the logo, right. let it run for a week and see what happens. Right. And, and then you can get really interesting stuff. So, and then of course you can use code interpreter to like, <laughs> tell you. it may be simple enough at this point that it's like easy enough for a human to do it, but you know, code interpreter can look at like significantly large data sets and really chunk through them. So. Um, Here's a competitive analysis yeah. of, uh, for Tesla. Okay, and cool. This came off of a website that had done a, a competitive analysis. And now, if you if you read a competitive analysis report, it's can be dozens of pages of all sorts of details, all sorts of you know information. Uh, and so, what we did here is we said, okay, well, what are the kind of attributes of a good competitive analysis? Build me a spreadsheet, and this is pre-code interpreter. Right, this is just the the raw chat GPT 3.5, I think. Build me the 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 matrix and fill the empty cells with the appropriate information. So this is generated by chat GPT, right? And so all of a sudden the students are dynamically generating a competitive analysis for this particular industry. And they had to choose between, you know, stationary storage and uh, and auto and stuff like that. But then now that we've got this raw information, then they can start sitting down and talking about, okay, where do I see the competitive advantages, disadvantages. I, I don't understand the difference here. Chat GPT, help me on that. Discuss it with the team, things like that. So they're, they're, again, instead of just doing the work of aggregating the data in the classroom, they're doing the interpretation analysis strategy thinking part of the work, which is what I want them doing anyway. Uh, and so, again, a really nice way of, of putting this together. Let me give you one more here. Um, sure. This I is all that. really fascinating. And, and for, you know, other teachers, as you're bringing up that next example, it's the, it, it's, you really have to think about this as like, not being punitive about it and saying like, no way you can't use these tools is not a good idea because right. you're going to allow the, the students again, like what is the use of learning cursive or learning to do multiplication tables out to like, 30 or something like that, when you can have a calculator do that for you, or, you know, you can just have the computer type it up for you. The usefulness is to get to the level where you're thinking creatively and you're thinking strategically about things, not doing the baseline work. And so right. this is the kind of thing where you can think about it as a teacher, you can lift your students from that very, very rapidly so that they can work on things that are more interesting. And, and quite frankly, I don't think even writing, one of the best things about writing, and this is the very old adage, is that the way to become a good writer is to become a good reader, is to read a lot. And and if you are generating these things and ChatGPT is doing that, you still have to, you, you can't just turn it in that way, at least if you're any kind of reasonable student, you have to read it and you have to look it over and you have to edit it, which means that you are still interacting with it and you're learning potentially how to write better because you're like, oh, that's a really good turn of phrase or something. So anyway, I'll let you continue on here. Yeah. Okay. So, so let me preface this a little bit. I, and again, I know that the audience isn't all marketing faculty, but you know, this is my space. So this is kind of where I've been trying to innovate in this, in this stuff. Um, one of the ass big assignments that the students do during the semester is they have a data set with some survey data. Uh, and it's within in the context of a case that a friend of mine wrote where uh, Intel 
is moving into the smartwatch product category, right? Into the smartwatch market. And so they get this, this survey data and they have to drop it into an Excel template that will create segments for them. And then they have to interpret those segments. And then they've got to describe each of the difference. There's two segments that they're looking at, describe each of those segments and then make some decisions about who, uh, which segment to target and then who should Intel partner with. And this is all within the case. The details aren't terribly important. So what I did is I took the segmentation data, which is the data that um, reflects kind of the needs, wants, and desires of the customer. You know, how important is this is this product attribute to you? Well, really important, not so important, right? So you take that, what, how much are you willing to pay? Eh, lots, little. So I take that data and I drop it into um, this. Now this is ChatGPT with Code Interpreter, which we all have access to now. Uh, you're a market segmentation expert. Please take the uploaded data and find the optimal two segments from the sample. Report the overall average and segment averages for each variable uh, with the accept, the accept the observations column and then report which observations are in which of the segments. So this is bog standard marketing segmentation, right? Uh, and so you drop it in. The beautiful thing is, is that Code Interpreter will do all of the legwork to... Now, I think you should be able to see if I show the work. Yeah, so it does all of the legwork in the background for organizing the data the way that it likes it, um, doing the analysis, creating the clusters, grabbing the APIs that it needs, all that sort of stuff. It's, it's gorgeously done. And it generates my two, uh, my two different segments. So segment O, segment one, right? Now, when I check this against my template, it's about 99% the same. And it just has to do with, you know, the, the math behind it. It's not that, it, there's no sub substantive difference between the two segments that are generated here versus using the template. All right. right. Then, and, and I have to say that there are some libraries. I love that it's using uh, uh, K-means clustering, by the way, which is awesome. Old yeah. school AI stuff. But yeah. um, it, it's also just really cool to see how it generates actually generally very nice code. I know the people who are like the super duper programmers are like, all right, all right it's just basic stuff. But I'm like, well, that's okay. <laughs> it's a lot of grunt work to build out that stuff and to actually write that code. And it's much more fun to have something else do it for you. And just like reading, you can look at the code and actually learn. If you're not that good of a coder in a specific language, you can learn how to code better just by looking yeah. at it. And that's really cool too. Yep. Uh, so then it tells me which observations are in which segment. So you can see that segment O is about half the size mm -hmm. of segment one. Mm -hmm. Then I ask it to create a file with that information in it. Then I asked, and I and it gave me two different separate files. And I said, oh, just combine those for me. <laughs> then so I, then I download the the this, and then I upload the descriptive data, which is kind of the demographics, what job do you have, how much money you make, that sort of thing, which is is what you use to describe the two segments that have been created by their needs, wants, and desires, right? So you 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 segment based on behavioral attributes, and then you describe them using the, the descriptive attributes. So I essentially combine all this and do all of this um, through ChatGPT. So then it generates um, averages for each of the segments with across all of my variables. And then I, uh, let's see, I created a data set. Then I think I did a t-test. Yeah, just, just a simple... Right. Right. Yes, to see where the significant differences are, and it generates a chart with all the significant differences. Now, what a student will traditionally do is just, and remember, these are students that have taken marketing research. They have some exposure to, to, to statistics. They've done this in class before, so they generally know what, what it is at the right. level of an undergraduate. Um, but a lot of times, they would just eyeball it, right? right. Well, right. you know, the segment one is willing to pay about $10 more. Okay, that's fine. That's great. <laughs> yeah. And that's kind of you know traditional marketers, right? Yeah, it looks like it looks about good. But if you look at the at the willingness to pay, um, the p-value is like 0.43. So it's clearly not significant. Right. 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 But and so that's another place where we can talk and we can say, okay, well, are these differences really significant? When you eyeball it, maybe it looks right. Here it clearly is not. Right. right. And so then, okay, so here's the beautiful part. After we've gotten these out, the next part that I'm going to do is say, okay, assume that I have to create personas for each of these segments. Personas are kind of like the description of these individuals right. written in sort of prose. Yeah, here we go. 
right? It just generates them for me. Wow. Okay? I like traditional I, Tom. Yeah. And then I, I can say, okay, well, now that you've got these personas, write me marketing messages that'll appeal to each of these personas based on their needs, wants, and desires. Right. Generate those. Generate, now modify the marketing messages for the actual product, a smartwatch, right? I haven't even talked about what any of this, what the, what the product category is until this point. Right. Generates me market, marketing messaging. And again, and this gets back to the point that we were talking about earlier. This is the starting point. And this is what in the syllabus information that I showed you, it's the, these are the starting spots. Now I sit down with my team and I say, okay, uh, tech savvy appeal for segment zero, active Anna. Embrace innovation with Intel's cutting edge smartwatch designed for the tech savvy. Our sleek and modern watch integrates Intel's advanced technology to elevate your digital experience. You like that one? You don't like it? Let's talk about it. Right. right? And so then I can come up with pros and cons. The teams will come up with pros and cons for each of these. Right. If they don't like any of them, generate three more, generate five more. Right. Then what can I call the Intel smartwatch? Give me a mm -hmm. list of three choices and create logos for each of those brand names. Right. So it allows absolute creativity in the classroom on the fly with multiple people doing multiple things, multiple team members doing multiple things. They're, they're all pecking at this thing from different directions because they're all going to use slightly different prompts. They're going to do have slightly different ideas. And then again, it's, then it becomes, we take 20 minutes to do this at the beginning, this class or this, this um, assignment usually takes about three days when you do it like the long way. Right. I was just going to ask you that. I was like, before you get to the interesting stuff, you've got three days worth of just yeah. grinding on numbers and making sure you've got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And making sure that everybody got it, got it right. And where did you make the mistake? How did you write your, you know, what, what formula did you write wrong? That kind of thing. Right. Here I can just bypass all, because that's not really the point of the assignment is not, you know, you should have learned that sort of thing back when you were taking marketing research. And right. if you didn't, I mean, that's kind of on you, but at least here I can, you know, hey, remind you, I'm reminding you of what you did back then. And this is why it's useful because now right. you've got to actually use it to make some decisions. Um, yeah. And so it just, it works absolutely beautifully for this sort of thing. And again, we couldn't do this three months ago, right? right. I, I right. couldn't just drop the data into uh, code interpreter and let it generate um, the uh, the clusters and all that sort of thing. It's, right. uh, it's right. fantastic. Yeah. And, and it's just, it's amazing stuff. And, and I'll, um, maybe I could share just real yeah, quick here, off. just as another example, just, uh, hold on, let me pop this up. So, um, this just, <laughs> again, this was just something I just popped up right now, but I just asked it to create a web page, um, with a prompt, you know, topic, whatever, create a joke. Anyway, it, it, it pops this up in HTML, just standard stuff. Then it explains it. And of course I would be able to ask it to reinterpret that and everything. But the big thing for me is that this is, this is amazing stuff for, for people who are doing more technical work, but in the creative space, because like I said, I'm teaching a screenwriting class for the first time since this happened. I mean, the last time it happened was the very, very end of the year. So it was kind of like, well, it didn't really have much of an effect. But this fall, it's like, how do I do this in a creative space where the whole point of the class is for students to write screenplays? So it's, what is your concept for the screenplay? What do you do? There's a whole bunch of strate uh, strategic stuff and, and exercises I do. And all of those are a little bit out the window now. Because there's all of these kind of like sit down and do like a 10 minute play or something like in class and just write something out really fast or or brainstorm ideas or have a critique of of these things in roundtables and stuff where they, they critique each other's work. Well, a lot of this now can be done with ChatGPT. I mean, you can actually give it your uh, if you give it a monologue or something, you can have ChatGPT critique it and say, mm -hmm. you know, pretend that you're a professional screenwriting agency or something and tell me what's good and what's bad about this this thing uh so so you can utilize it in so many ways that uh and i already require my students to have laptops in class for that class and i, I think it's just going to be a lot of work where we have students sort of in a group do assignments have it ideate with them, have it critique what they're working on. I'm still working on this, by the way. <laughs> like you can tell that I'm still a little nebulous, but it's the kind of thing where it's just like, there's so many new possibilities in this space. Um, the, the the other option would be for me to say, no, you can't use this, but students are going to use it. I, I, I inquired with my classes last January, like the first day of class. 
and about a third of the class knew what chat GPT was or large language models. By spring break around the middle of March, I asked and everybody knew what it was. So that's 100% of my classes knew. And I was like, well, at that point, what are you going to do? You can't fight that because if they know it, they're using it. So, and it's basically undetectable, especially for creative things. Because you could say, well, yeah, if you have a very specific prompt for a paper on biology about doing this kind of stuff, maybe you could detect it. But if the prompt is write an interesting screenplay, it's like, <laughs> there's no way to detect whether something like ChatGPT has written it unless you look at it and you're like, well, this is really boring. But a lot of times students write really boring ones too. So, yeah. Um, well, you know, and I was, if you, um, there's a, let me pop this up because I think, uh, and this is not an assignment. This is a, uh, somebody is, div somebody, I should be more precise. <laughs> uh, who is this? Here we go. This is, um, and I'm hoping that this will, should play through, through here. Um, this is an avatar that you can see right, right here. Right. And I don't know if we'll be able to hear this. In the sound, early days of computer oh, programming, no, <laughs> a significant historical anecdote is known as Grace Hopper and the Bug. In 1947 at Harvard University. So it gets the accent, it gets everything like that. Now, if I'm, if we're six, 12 months down the road here, this is the start of making my movie. So if I'm sitting in class, right. I'm generating my short script, I'm using AI to generate a movie, and I'm I'm showing my creativity in the classroom using those tools. Like you would never be able to assign. Well, I've tried this. Go out and create a commercial with your iPhone for right. Cosmic Crisp apples or something like that, right? Something that we're working on in class, and it comes back. And some of them are super creative, but students really don't. I shouldn't say don't, don't know, but they they have don't have a lot of experience with doing like framing and editing and all those sorts right. of things. And right. so you get some pretty linear stuff and. Some cool yeah. stuff and some not, but with these tools, now I can say, okay, go out and, you know, create a news hit for using an avatar, like with Synthasia, right. with Synthasia or something like that, where you're explaining this new concept or this new product, you know, because like the PR hits that, that go on the news all the time, you know, there's all kinds of create, create creative things to do like that. And, and it really, I don't want to say it doesn't matter what, what discipline area you're in, you can still do these things. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I was going to ask do you, do you have thoughts on, um, especially in your space, uh, this ability to create within the context of the, of the strike, the writer's strike? Well, <laughs> I, I'm very torn about this, but my advice to the writers and the actors is to, is to take whatever deal they can get. Um, and, and I say this with a great deal of humbleness because my own child, my oldest son is in the industry and it's his, it's his livelihood. Um, and I want the best for them, but I also realize that within three years, they're going to probably be irrelevant. And, and mm. it's, it's a terrible thing to say. Uh, I, I, I think the same thing about musicians too. Um, I think people are going to do it for fun. People, people still play chess. Right. Nobody makes an argument that that the best chess player in the world is a human being anymore, but people still do it. And you obviously have a ton of guitars back there. So I don't foresee you giving up on doing that. And people will still like live concerts and stuff. But I, I just see a lot of this stuff just going by the wayside. It's so expensive to tour. It's so expensive to write music. It's so expensive to make movies that why not just move towards accepting the fact that a lot of this stuff is going to be made. And there will probably be just like, I did a whole episode about mechanical watches versus like these guys and stuff. And there will be a, there will be a group of people who will be like, I want to have one that's made by people. And so, yeah, there will still certainly be that sort of market, but I think it will be a niche market in the future. Um, well, and, and this is right. This is the classic disruption curve. Oh yeah. Right? Happening Probably very fast though. Off. Cost goes to zero, right? You know, and and we we literally start my class with that curve on the on the right thing. <laughs> look at this, and then as we go through and we look at all these different companies, you see it yeah. over and over and over again. And I I mean we're going to see such an explosion of creativity in music and art and right. movies and everything over right. the next three to five years. I mean I, I use that just as an old person saying eh, five years down the road, whatever. Right. <laughs> Tomorrow. And and again, this gets back to our idea of of 
all of these kids around the world banging away at these problems. There's right. thousands, tens of thousands of kids right now working on how to get make a movie using their iPhone and AI. Exactly. And, well, and let me just, this is something that I actually thought of while you were talking. And so I really appreciate this because I don't know why I didn't think of it before, but one of the assignments for the for the writing class, it's a screenwriting class. And one of the problems is the students, so let's say I want to do a fantasy one about these people in this particular world that have were hogs or something, I don't know, whatever. Instead of having to sit there and talk about it and wave your hands, which is what they always have to do. And some of the time I have very talented students who will sketch things out and things and be like, this is what I'm looking for. Now they can all do that. I can go, one of my assignments will be, um, is now going to be to give me a, a landscape, go to mid journey or something, or go to stable diffusion. Give me like, what it is, what is this landscape that you're looking at? What is the environment that this screenplay is going to take place in? And then what do the characters look like? Give me the couple of main characters and do a, just do a, a, the best job you can. Obviously it doesn't have to be a hundred percent, but show them to me. Like, what do these characters look like in this fantasy world? Or if it's a 1950s sitcom or something, you know, what do they look like? Are they completely overdressed? And like, so th that can be an assignment that never would have been possible before, because assuming that 20 beginner screenwriters have artistic ability is, is that's not going to happen. A couple of them will, but not all of them, but now they can, and they can go, this is what it looks like. This is what I see. And that's amazing that, that they can express that level of creativity through these things like mid journey, stable diffusion, Dolly, et cetera. Yeah. So. No. And you think of all of those um, amazing piano players that can't sing. Right. 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 And they want to write, they want to write vocal parts. Well, now right. I can just have whoever in the world sing on top of my song, right. Exactly. Just with, with an AI. And so, and, and I've always kind of considered this, it's, it's almost like you're dropping dropping barriers yes right so if i if i'm i might have world class skills in one one spot here but not in two and three other spots right but now i can out augment those skill those lack of that lack of skill that i have with the ai and i can you know express my vision in a movie express my vision in a song express my vision in art right and, and we mentioned this the last time we talked as what you know it's true disruption happens when all of these curves kind of coincide right and right. we're just about to have a situation where everybody on the world in the world has access to high-speed internet via starlink and other satellite providers right, right. and so it's not just going to be the privileged few that have access to all these tools it will be everybody right. and the wall of content and entertainment and creativity is just going to be immense Especially when you consider we're at the bottom of that hockey stick, <laughs> it's going to yeah. be like, shit, boom, yeah. boom, just it's like, going to go oh, straight vertical. Yeah. So. yeah. yeah. Um, so I want to, I want to actually want to talk about that. I want to table that for one small second, but the Joshua uh, Zhu, I think was his last name. Anyway, it reproduced his accent like really, really well in the avatar. But let's say you are a person who has a heavy accent in a foreign country and you want to get rid of that. That also will be possible. So what, you know, if, if John was like, if I spoke with a heavy German accent and I wanted to not have that anymore, that is now an option. I could record my videos that I want to do. Oh, eventually the AI is just going to generate these videos for me, but, uh, but then I can just remove that accent and I could speak with a standard English accent if I want to American accent. Um, I so wonder, that, that's as fascinating in its own right. I think. The, I, I wonder though, what the, what the outcome of that is. Do we, do we standardize on, I mean, if everybody's if everybody's trying different accents and styles to get the best engagement or the best ability to communicate their ideas, wouldn't we eventually kind of standardize on probably. one or, two or three? Yeah, it'll probably be like some sort of high class British accent or something that seems everybody seems to love British accents. So yeah, <laughs> try myself out with a British accent. Uh, but so you brought up something, and I think this gets into a really big picture thing. And so I, you know, we've been talking for like an hour, so why not? Why not go there and see if we um can and can work our way towards that? But you're talking about, and Elon Musk has been very clear about this, that the traditional education system is not long for this world. Uh, I don't know if you agree with that or not, but if you're looking at people having access to high-speed internet and having access to all of this stuff on the internet, why do we still need high schools? And, I, and you know, up to middle school, I can see you need kids to have like experience with others and stuff and, and to be educated in person. But after that, why not just break it off and have everybody just sit at home and 
on their computer and do stuff. What is the case to be made for education and how does education have to be different than it has been? Uh, well, I mean, there's kind of a short term and a long term look okay. at this. Right? Okay. Um, short term, we're social creatures. We like being around each other. You know, I'm I'm watching my my 11, 12 year old start start the process of learning how to work in social groups and deal with, I don't want to say bullies, but you know, the things yeah. that kids learn to deal with. Um, and I'm at a small college town in Eastern Washington, where when the students aren't here, there's 7,000 people in town. And when they are, there's 30,000 people. Right. Yeah. And when we, when we got out of, uh, out of the, the lockdowns and everything like that, and we ask our students after them being on, uh, on zoom for two years, a year and a half, whatever it was. Right. How much they wanted to come back. It was like 97% of them wanted to be in class. So I think there is a strong pull for that part of the university experience. Now, that said, we also have a group of students coming up right now that spent some of their formative years online at 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old who may feel like that's a better way for them to learn. And there is going to be a segment of the population who will opt to, to learn that way anyway right we know that right. there's a ton of self starters and and you know there's you can look at the number of of views on some of these learn to write python or learn python videos it's millions oh, of yeah. people yeah yeah and even if people are just using it as a reference there is some percentage of those people that are learning a skill on their own by themselves and there will all, there is going to be a massive space for that um for for the university um i st i think and this is of course self serving because i'm a professor <laughs> but I think at least hopefully some of the discussion that we had in the first hour um, would indicate that there is some value to still coming together and talking about and working on these things in person, um, regardless of the university experience and the socialization and things like that. I, I think there is still right. some of that. Um, I think guidance from an expert in the field and feedback from an expert in the field is important because a lot of times students don't know what to focus on or don't know what to, to look for in uh, what's, I should say, what's important, right? What's the big takeaway here? Those sorts of things. And so in the short term, I think that that's still um, still going to be valuable. Although I, I completely will understand if you don't have access to the kind of traditional university or traditional high school, there are going to be a lot of options for you to build that skill base. Now, on the flip side, you can cynically look at uh, private schools, universities, colleges as sort of gate, gate, gatekeepers, right? You, why do I right. need to get this piece of paper from a university when I can show you um, that I have this skill set that I learned myself on YouTube or through Khan Academy or whatever it is? Or if I'm one of the Google or Amazon types um, or Starbucks, right, which is paying to send to, to send their employees to college, you know, if I'm teaching you everything that you need to know, and I'm augmenting that with kind of a, you know, a, I don't want to say general studies, but some other, some other degree that you're interested in, I can kind of tailor the education that I need to, you know, build managers, build, build the future leaders of my company. And that's a very kind of private industry way of, of thinking about right. this. Right. Um, I think this is going to be messy. Uh, I think that some of our older faculty are going to dig in their heels and and just kind of fight the transition and say, I, you know, I've got three more years. I'm just going to bear, you know, just do what I do and kind of put the blinders on and hope that, you know, nothing bad happens. Um, but I've also, you know, I've got four PhD students who have either just or are just about to hit their first jobs. Right. Just as this tsunami is about to hit. And so right. a lot of our discussion is like, OK, how are you going to integrate this? How are you thinking about this? What are you how are you going to create value for these students so that they want to come to class and they want to learn? Uh, right. under your tutelage or un in this particular set of conditions at the at this college. Um, but I think long term, you know, uh, <laughs> once we've got chips in our heads and goggles on our faces and, and you can't discern between the real world and, and your virtual one, right. you may have the same experience, but it's just going to be you're sitting at your house, which I find terrifying, but it's, it's a possibility. Yeah, it's really interesting because, you know, Elon Musk has been very much like education doesn't need to be at universities and, and and in person. 
And he's all about being able to learn on your own, which is fantastic. And he's right. But then at the same time, he is the most hardcore person about you have to come to work. <laughs> like yeah. a lot of tech companies are like, yeah, stay at home if you want to, and we'll do whatever and we'll work around it. But he's like, no, you have to be here. So I, I tend to agree with you that there is an, a critically important aspect of education, which is the socialization aspect. And I I go back and I think about like high school and college. And I mean, I do remember classes, but most of what I remember is just hanging out with my friends and talking and in college, staying up way too late and talking about some book that you read, you know, whatever, just, just mm -hmm. totally geeky stuff. But those were very formative and super important um, aspects. And the other piece of it is because then this is new, dear to my heart. And so I'm fully admitting my own bias, but I am a very, very, I very much believe that you have to have a very wide range of understanding of things. Uh, and the danger of being at home is that you can be like, I want to learn how to program Java. And that's all you do. And so you get to be good at doing that. But then it's like, well, what the hell else do you know? And, and I I don't think that, that that doesn't set you up well for the future. Like you need to have to take some of those classes that you think you don't want. Like you have to take a philosophy class or you have to take a, a, an art class or something. And you're like, oh, actually, this is really cool. I'm never going to be great at it, but I really enjoyed taking the class and I, it opened up a new horizon to me. And, and I think that that level is important. I think the core curriculum, like in colleges, a lot of people argue against it, but I'm like, no, we're liberal arts. Like it's important that you have a wide range of experience. So I will at least, at least I'll throw that one up there. I don't know exactly how that works in the future. I think maybe it comes to some sort of augmentation where instead of like right now I can maximum teach like 20 students in a computer situation because I have 20 computers. So that's it. That's as far as I can go. Um, or I can only teach 20 students in a writing class because I have to be able to like keep track of all of that. And it's immense, it's an immense amount of work to like read and react to all of that stuff. But suddenly, like if we can go from that to like hundreds or thousands of people mm -hmm. at the same time, uh, or, you know, that, that, that suddenly opens up a lot of doors that allows education to come down in cost. Cause that's one of the huge negatives in my mind is it's such, a, it's such a privileged thing, right? It's, it's, to go to even a basic state college is probably going to cost you 60 grand over the years for the housing and all of that kind of stuff. And if you go to a private school, it's going to cost a lot more than that for four years. Could cost you 350, 400,000, somewhere in that order to go to school for four years. And that is a, a huge chunk for, it's impossible for a lot of people. And even for people who are fairly well off, it, it's a huge, it's a huge ask. And it puts people in a lot of dire straits financially afterwards. And so those are the kind of things that need to be addressed. And some of that I think can be done through scale, but then the opposite comes about with like your PhD students who are going out and looking for a job. It's like, well, sorry, this professor is now teaching 10 times the number of people that she used to. And so we don't need you anymore. <laughs> it's like, you're not necessary. Um, no. So, yeah. I, I think that, I think that the, I mean, if you look at inf inflation across different, um, product categories and industries and things like that the two three highest inflation areas are like textbooks universities and healthcare right places yeah. where there yeah. are strong there is strong gatekeeping there's a vested interest to keep salaries high there's a huge amount of administrative that costs a lot and so those right. prices are passed on to consumers and if the consumers but but there's the demand stays high because the degree that you have signals to the marketplace that you um, are at least worthy of looking at it if you to see if you can create value for this firm or create something of value for society or whatever. Um, it's going to get harder and harder to convince society that that is the case, uh, especially right. at the prices and the debt load that you're that you're potentially taking on, um, and that is. Uh, it's not a problem, but it's something that's going to change. I, I I feel like the bloat and the the cost of of a university education is is just going to be unobtainable especially when you look at the sort of interest rates that we're at and things like that right one one thing that i i will mention you and you said this kind of at the very beginning of of this um the the idea that that a, a young person 
and I'm not saying all young people, but young, you know, young individuals who are super self-motivated, maybe just want to learn Java and just learn Python and those sorts of things. Right. And your point is kind of like, well, you need to learn or at least be exposed to all of these other areas. I think that part of the responsibility for that is on the faculty member, right? Because, yeah. you know, I'm at an age now that I've read enough and seen enough and done enough that I can pull from these different areas of interests and show students, hey, when you're talking about X, Y, Z over here, well, there's an entire industry or there's an entire discipline area that studies that specifically. So if you're interested in learning more about it, go look there, right? right. Um, and that just comes with age, right? We, we all learn, hopefully we're all continuing to learn as we go along our own journeys. Um, and, and, you know, if you're, you're probably predisposed to that if you're an academic. Right. right. The, the right. job that doesn't really have a schedule. I mean, it does in the sense you got to be in the classroom occasionally, but you know, everything else is self self-motivated and the types of people that choose to do this are the types of people that, that are interested in doing that. Um, but I know, especially over in the last few years where we've focused on kind of a broader picture, you know, you're under your 200 and 300 level classes are like, learn the skills, learn the topics, learn the techniques, learn the, Right. you know, the, the information, then when you get up to the, to the top level, you know, your senior level classes, here's how this all goes together. And part of the responsibility is on that faculty member to say, Hey, look, this is how economics fits in here. This is how demand fits in here. This is how innovation fits in here, right? There's, we talk, we talk about all sorts of topics in a marketing class that go across the entire business world, business disciplines, but then we're also now talking about things like AI and computer science and, you know, cultural experience and all the other sorts of things that go along with it. And, and so and art as well. You have to interact and, with yeah. people designing logos and exactly. And stuff. Yeah, exactly. And if, and if you would have, if you look at the experience that a student even 10 years ago would have had in that exact same class called marketing management, it's completely different. And it's just a bigger universe of knowledge and information and interconnectivity and learning that the students are doing. And when I look at my, you know, the last couple of years um, have been focused on, you know, really integrating these different, all of the different business areas into this final thing and saying like, okay, where does finance fit in here? Where does accounting fit in here? All that. Um, and the the comments I'm getting from students are very much, wow, I didn't realize that these were also interconnected. I've kind of thought as like finances over there, accounting's over there, human resources over there, marketing's over there. Nah, in a business, it all goes together, and they've all got to work together, in you know, synchronously to be able to 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 make this thing work and to create value. Um, and so I think that's a, a big part of it too. Now, will uh, will on online learning experiences get better at pulling these kind of threads all together? Probably. Um, but that's probably some area where we can really create a lot of value, at least in the in the short term. Right. Okay. I, I can agree with that. And it is, it's it's hard to think like five years in the future, even at this point. So it's I'm much. just trying to think in the next couple of years, be, because, you know, what, if the Apple like headset, whatever, if that becomes a thing and that, and that really takes off and there's a bunch of this and it, it becomes everybody wearing these ready player one glasses, then the world is so different than it was. And especially if we get neural link chips in our heads then all bets are off because of course you can have that social experience without having to get out of bed, <laughs> which has a lot of downsides to it too. But at the same time, it, it's, it, it will be very different, but at least for the foreseeable future, we're not looking at that technology being broad-based at this point, but man, it's just, it's such a, it's such a weird thing because my entire career has been built around being in academia and being somebody that learns and being somebody that teaches and it seems to be at risk right now. There, there seems to be a lot of danger to that mode of operating in the world, not being something that is going to be viable long-term, or at least not in its current form. And one of the main reasons why is that academia has basically priced itself out of relevancy. Yeah. It's become something that only the privileged people can do or and or you go into so much debt that you're in debt for most of the rest of your life trying to pay off that bill. And both of those are not great options. And it's impossible for somebody who's living in a village in sub-Saharan Africa to even think about that. That's not a possibility for them. So that's where something like Starlink and the internet and AI suddenly makes this all radically different because that person who didn't even have that option before now does have that option. 
And how many more Edison's or Einstein's or Elon Musk's are we going to discover if we have, you know, seven plus billion people have access rather than just one billion people having access to this information. It's it's gonna it's gonna really, really change things. And I think for the better, but like you said, it's gonna be messy getting there. It's gonna be yeah. very, very messy. It's gonna be very messy. And I mean, in the same way that uh, a lot of uh, areas of the world skipped completely over the landline yes. phone in, in right. system and went straight to cellular, a lot of them are going to skip right over the traditional university model and go right to online learning. Again, banging away at their keyboards, learning what they want to learn with people out there attempting to build businesses and experiences that, they, that they're willing to pay for and that they're willing to, to, um, to use. So yeah, um, when I'm in my most cynical moods, it's not great. But um, the thing wait, is, wait, so wait, wait. Let's nothing. let's let's take a positivist attitude towards. Oh yeah. This. So, at the same time that I said a professor could become ten times more productive, we could have ten times more students. Yeah. Like we we can do something like that, so that we can a rising tide could lift all boats. You could have your new PhD students come out because. There are so many more people that want to learn these topics now that have access to you that didn't, yeah. they used to have to live in Eastern Washington, right? They, they used to have to be live within a couple hundred miles of you, or they had to come in and like fly in from someplace far away, you know, very complicated kind of stuff. So a relatively few number of people could get there and be educated. That is not such an issue anymore. Right. And, and I think, and I, I definitely don't want to come across as cynical because we either do nothing and it all goes away, or we work our butts off to try to figure out a way to make, in the light of this change that's coming, make this work and make it right. good for students and make it create value. And, you know, um, and that's kind of what I want to do. I, I don't want to wait for my retirement. <laughs> I wanted, I wanted, because this is fun. This is, this is the idea. The yeah. whole reason we're doing this is and teaching and, and interacting with students and things is because we like doing it, you know? Right. And I, you know, I love my job and I love what I do and I love my students. I love my PhD students and I'd rather them not go away, <laughs> you know? Yes. yes. So and I think how we do that is going to be the the big question. Yeah. We, we are at heart social creatures and we do best in groups. And this, while this is great, I would much rather be able to sit down and have a beer with you and talk about this, right? Yeah. You know, it would be, it would be better in person. So there's, these are okay as a substitute as a simulacrum for for real life interaction but i think that we do do our best in person so i think the case when it is possible for people to be able to get together is important and education should not like traditional types of high schools universities things like that they have a place it's an important place the problem is that they've become number one very kind of like stayed <laughs> they didn't want to like for example my university does not want anybody ever having not even one zoom class during the year so if i have to go away for a conference i can't hold a class because they're like no you can't do that and i'm like well, that's stupid like you know i could easily have a class where i could like just teach the class anyway while i'm at this conference in a way um <laughs> i'm gonna get in trouble for saying this stuff <laughs> but anyway but you know but it's like why why be that like uh, reticent to allow improvements to be made in education. But, and then overall, I think we can get further afield, which is that even for people who, if you can come to campus and you can do it and you can have that experience, do it. But if you are not somebody who that's either through distance or through money or something where that's not really a viable option, then great, we can provide for that too. And I think that that's really important for education. That is, after all, the whole point of what we're doing is to teach people, to make them better citizens, more productive citizens, more thoughtful citizens. That's what we want. We all want that. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And I, every time there's a closed source solution and an open source solution, the open source mm. solution wins. Mm. Yep. Every yep. time somebody limits your ability to do a Zoom class while you're traveling, it somebody else is going to be able to, is going to allow it, right. you know, and, and I don't, I often wonder how deeply when these decisions come down, people have thought about the kind of second and third order effects of them. Right. Right. You know, um, and I, I just, I have a feeling that, that we're going to, we're going to see more openness, more inclusivity, more flexibility 
going forward? Because if we don't, students will choose the option that uh, right. that uh, that affords them that. Right. Uh, and so I, I think we're going to probably have to, you know, kind of be realistic and be more flexible about about how we're um, doing our classes and how we're you know teaching people and and our job now is figuring out the best ways to do this under these new kind of more open borders if, if for lack of a better term right? right what does it mean you know how do i how do i get my students to make sure that they watch all of the videos on my asynchronous class because that might be the only way that they can take the that they can take the class how can i assess that they're getting you know if they're taking a completely online class how can i make sure that i'm that i'm accurately assessing what they're doing that's a tough one Right. And there's a lot well, of you throw to and to get back to large language models, you throw that into the mix where you're doing completely mm -hmm. asynchronous and the students have access to all of this stuff out there. How do you know that? How do you how do you not even how do you know that they're doing that? Because that's too punitive. But how do you determine the best way to educate them so that that usage is encouraged and usable and creates value? And they're still doing work on top of that. Hopefully more interesting work than just the basic boilerplate stuff, but they're still doing work. Yeah. How do I know that somebody hasn't just um, spun up a chat GPT window that says, go to Washington State's online <laughs> university and take all the classes for me? <laughs> right. Oh, gosh, with the avatars, you don't even have to be there anymore. You just have a person that just sits there and goes like, mm, OK, I understand. You know, <laughs> so there you go. Of course, on the flip side, that means that we don't have to be there either. Right. So we got avatars talking to avatars. So we'll have we'll have the the professor AIs talking to the student AIs, and everyone else is we'll just be drinking mai tais. Everyone will be drinking mai tais, mm -hmm. <laughs> waiting for that universal basic income to come about. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, this has been just a fascinating discussion. And again, I know this is not the normal topic for this channel, but I really do hope that a lot of people are interested. And definitely let us know in the comments, like you know thoughts that you have about this, um, creative solutions to the problem. And I really want to consider this uh, like a first attempt at this. And then maybe I, I really do want to do a round table. I think Scott, he he was very generous and said that he would not join us for this one because I was like, I just want to keep it like super academic. But I'd like to have him and maybe one other person with kind of more different viewpoints so that we can talk about this on a broader basis and how this is how this will affect the industry as well as academia. I mean, that there's going to be- Aren't you supposed to be interviewing Elon here pretty quick? I, hey, Elon. Hey, yo, interview me. <laughs> I would love to talk to you. I have asked so many times. I've tweeted back to him and stuff and said, hey, really want to talk to you about education. I feel like I have an insight into that. So yeah, if he wants to join the round table, then by all means, let's yeah. we'll put it on X exclusively if he wants to do that. So there you go. All righty. Anyway, yes. <laughs> so whoever it will be that will join us, I think it would be great to have a roundtable discussion about this. And for people in academia, um, you know, let us know what's going on at your universities or high schools or middle schools or whatever. Oh, heck, elementary schools at this point, why not? Uh, and we'd love to find out about that. So everybody have a lovely day. Thank you all so much for watching this until the end. And we will talk to you later. Bye-bye.